again I have to express my surprise at why why you offer incense and then extinguish it I, I asked the Pujari he says because he doesn't like the smell everyone hates incense here is it why do you extinguish what, what? is it just some kind of tradition or what They don't like it. No, they, they, get, they prefer this breathing. Yeah, well, they can sit away from it. But it's offered for the pleasure of Krishna. He likes it. So, uh, offered for the pleasure of Prabhupada. So, why extinguish it? If, if it's so bad, then why offer it in the first place? Why don't you light it? I, I lit it. Someone extinguished it. And then I... I lit it again and then someone again extinguished it. It's like some kind of rule that <laughs> incense should not be burned. Is it you can't imagine relighting it now, it's like great apparat or something. The description is there of Dwarakadham of in the res in the palaces of Krishna, the incense is Incense smoke is billowing here and there. Krishna likes it. That's why we offer it. If we don't like it, that's our bad luck. We can open the window and sit next to it. Those those who hate incense can sit next to the window. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 3, Text 16, Translation and Commentary by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. As the different limbs of the body cannot see the eyes, the living entities cannot see the Supreme Lord, who is situated as the Super Soul in everyone's heart. Not by the senses, by the mind, by the life air, by thoughts within the heart, or by the vibration of words can the living entities ascertain the real situation of the Supreme Lord. Purport, although the different parts of the body do not have the power to see the eyes, the eyes direct the movements of the different body's different parts. The legs move forward because the eyes see what is in front of them and the hand touches because the eyes see touchable entities. <laughs> Similarly, every living being acts according to the direction of the super soul, who is situated within the heart, as the Lord Himself confirms in Bhagavad Gita. Saravasya chaham hridi sandevishto matasmite gyanam apohanamcha. I am sitting in everyone's heart and giving directions for remembrance, knowledge, and forgetfulness. Elsewhere in Bhagavad Gita it is stated. Ishvara Sarva Bhutanam Hridesha Arjuna Tishtati. The Supreme Lord as the Super Soul is situated within the heart. The living entity cannot do anything without the sanction of the Super Soul. The Super Soul is acting at every moment, but the living entity cannot understand the form and activities of the Super Soul by manipulating his senses. The example of the eyes and the bodily limbs is very appropriate. If the limbs could see, they could walk forward without the help of the eyes, but that is impossible. Although one cannot see the super soul in one's heart through sensual activities, his direction is necessary. Yamaraj continues his instructions to his messengers, who are called the Yamadutas. A fearsome word. The very thought of the Yamadutas is fearsome. But here they are receiving knowledge just like Rishis receive. Even Rishis, they don't generally get this high knowledge. Generally those who are Rishis, they get up to the point that the absolute truth cannot be 
seen by the eyes, understood by words, cannot be approached by any mental endeavor. Here the same thing is being said by Yamaraj, that the Absolute Truth cannot be understood by any of these means. But he is defining the Absolute Truth as the Supreme Person. So that's a step higher even than the Rishis. The Yamadutas couldn't have expected to have been given such instruction. They simply approached Yamaraj out of frustration that they had never been impeded in their activities anywhere. They, they, they regularly went and dragged people out of their or souls, out of the bodies, out of the human bodies. They don't go to non-human bodies. They drag the souls out of sinful bodies. Sorry, the body is not sinful, but the soul who has acted sinfully. The soul is also not sinful. But then who is sinful? Well, it's the, it's one of those, it's a, it's a question, who is acting? Is the soul acting or the modes are acting or the body is acting? So this, the soul who has accepted identification with the body and through the, through the means so the medium of the body has performed sinful activities, is dragged out by the Yamadutas. So the Yamadutas are, they're, they're not very nice actually. They're fearsome in appearance and they're not being nice is part of the job. If you, if you want to get a job as a Yamaduta, you have to look horrible. <laughs> so you go for a job. Certain jobs you're supposed to look very nice, like a film star or a model or a air hostess or something like that. So for Yamaduta you have to look horrible. Our devotee in Bombay, Haridas, who's now directing the TV shows, he got, he, he was a film star before, but he got this, he played the parts of the bad guy, so he's kind of ugly and nasty and so he, he got the part for being ugly. So the Yamaduta is, well actually the, the body goes with the job. When you when you get birth as a Yamaduta, I guess what do you get born from a Yamaduti? You don't hear about them, the female Yamadutas. There must be somewhere. So uh, nasty, horrible body. But uh, one devotee told me, one learned devotee. I haven't seen him myself, but he said that. Uh, I, I also, I know him for many years, he doesn't have the tendency to speculate. He's very learned in Shastra. So he told me that Bhaktivinoda Thakur had said that those who are offenders to Vaishnavas, they become Yamadutas. That's what you get. So they're, they're serving a Vaishnava, they're serving Yamaraj. But, and they're doing something required in the universal management. So they're, they're doing something which is good, but at the same time they're indulging their propensity of being nasty as possible and giving, and giving uh, distress to others. I mean, even to be a Yamadu, not everyone can do it. It's, not like, it's like not everyone can work in the slaughterhouse. You have to have a certain mentality to work in the slaughterhouses. Most people couldn't do it. Most people would just, as soon as they walk in, they'd vomit and walk out again because it's so horrible. So it requires a certain kind of nasty, extreme envy of other living entities to have such a job. So the Yamadutas, they're feeling, yeah, we're the Yamadutas, we're, you know, we're, no one can st no one can resist us. People see us. They the people see them with fear in their eyes, and the Yamadutas take pleasure. Ah, you can't escape. You must be dragged out of the body. They they start to come. 
they start to hover around someone who's on the verge of death. So they they feel tremendous fear. They end. Sometimes they say, oh, look, those beings, no one else can see them. They're possessed by fear. They have a term for it in, in medicine, something like pre-death or pre-death fear syndrome or something. I can't, that's not the test, something like that. What are they seeing the Yamadutas and they feel intense fear, but there's nothing they can do. No one can protect them. So the Yamadutas come and they rip the soul out of the body and drag him to before Yamaraj and then subject him to various punishments. And not, and they're quite confident that, okay, folks, there's another guy. Let's go and get him. So they're feeling, this is great. They take perverted pleasure that we, we run off, we drag people, they're, they're suffering, they're screaming. They're so afraid of us. If someone's afraid of you, you, then one who is demoniac, they take pleasure in that, in giving, in, in dominating over others by fear. There's a story of Stalin. This is a little tangential, but it gives an idea of how nasty, he, how nasty the jiva who is supposed to be in love of Krishna can be. So, someone was asking him, how do, you, how do you rule the people? How do you keep them under control? So he called for a chicken and he, he put the chicken on his lap and he pulled the feathers out one by one. And then, having done that, put the chicken on the floor and the chicken ran round and round his feet. So he said, you see, the chicken is coming around me. It's not running away because it knows that its life is in my hands. I can kill it or let it live, whatever. So now he just will do whatever I say. So like this, this is how you rule the people. That's one way, by, by fear, by extreme nastiness. And Stalin was expert at that, as is known. So, Yamadutas are like that. But then, and one time they went to get a Jami. This is how the story, this particular narration unfolded. They went to get a Jami and they thought, wow, this guy's really in for it. We're really going to have a lot of fun with him. He was a Brahmin and he fell away from his duties to become extremely sinful. And if... Someone is extremely sinful, that's one thing. But if they were previously a Brahmin and they become extremely sinful, then it's geometrically increased the volume of their punishment. So they, they were very confident. Then they were stopped by the Vishnu Dutas. And they said, hey, what are you doing? You can't. We, we, we're sent by Yamaraj. We got our job. Yamaraj, he... He's in control of all the sinful living entities in the universe. And he said, no, forget it. You can't. And they, they realized they were before a superior power. And they couldn't understand the principle that by chanting the holy names, he'd become free from sinful results. So they went back to Yamaraj angrily. Hey, what's going on? We thought we were serving you because we thought you were the boss. And that what you say is everyone has to follow. Now, it seems that someone else is also, they told us, we are servants of Lord Vishnu. And uh, we have, we, we are taking charge of this soul. So, are you the, we, we always thought you were the controller, but now we, is there more than one controller? He said, no, there's not more than one controller. But I am not the controller. Well, where... Where is he? Why, why didn't we see him all these days? You can't see him. Just this example is being given. You can't see him. You can't know him. You can't perceive him through the eyes. You can't hear him through the ears. As you can see him through the eyes, but not through Yamaduta eyes. Not through Yamaduta ears. One has to become purified. Yamaraj can see him. The Yamadutas cannot. Well, he cannot be seen by material eyes. He cannot... 
be ascertained by material intellection. But he reveals himself. This point is made again and again and again. He reveals himself to those he wants to reveal himself to. Those whose hearts are free of the tendency to exploit for one's own sense gratification. This tendency is so deep-rooted in the conditioned souls that even if they are even if they're superficially pious and believe in God, they also consider God is someone who is meant to cater to my sense gratification. So generally the, the concept of God is someone who is very good and good means he helps me in my sense gratification. That is the meaning of good according to the materialistic definition. So God is the Best of all, he is the most good because he caters to my sense gratification in a superlative manner, more than anyone else. So we all love God. But the meaning of love in this material world is that you like someone who caters to your sense gratification. Otherwise, why is it that men always fall in love with young women? You never hear of someone falling in love with an 80-year-old woman. Why is that? Because well, sometimes they do. Sometimes it happens. A young man marries an 80-year-old woman if she's rich because he's waiting for her to die and then he can enjoy all the money. It's a scheme. And men, old men who are rich, sometimes they marry young women and they know the young woman is just waiting for me to die and get my money. They don't give a damn for me. But they don't give a damn either because I'll enjoy while I can. So, love in the material world. I have seen <laughs> many times how, how parents love their children. One young man joins the Hare Krishna temple in a city away from the city he lives in. And so many times the mother gets so sick. When this happens, the mother gets extremely sick. And the only cure is if the son will come home. And it's so sick and then she can't live without him. And she doesn't, even she does, she's not going to force him to go out and earn money, but she just wants to see him. That's all. If unless I can see you, I cannot live. So all the relatives come crying, screaming, sobbing and going to commit suicide and that's that's another line common line so uh, then the boy goes back home then he gets an offer of a job in another city earning lots of money and it's amazing how the mother's sickness is cured immediately so she doesn't mind not seeing him if he's in another city earning lots of money or even if he goes to America from India and earn lots of money they'll be very happy they can just they can just it's very difficult for them to tolerate the separation, but getting a thousand dollars a month, they can just about do it. <laughs> so this is love in the material world. That their love that I can only live with unless I see you. You know what I'm talking about in particular? No. <laughs> yeah. The love is uh, love of money, actually. They see in that's one reason the family Family ties in uh, societies in which the governments don't give money to people who aren't working. The family ties are much stronger because the family has to stay together for economic reasons. But as soon as the government gives money to uh, people who aren't working, and to then uh, then the, and they they give money so or they give money to old people pensions. And then the, the parents, they don't care so much for their children. And they even throw them out. What are you doing now? 18 years old, you're still here. I looked after you for 18 years. Get out. Whereas in a, in a, in a country where there's the, the, children, the parents are thinking that the children have to look after me in old age, then they'll keep them at home and look after them very nicely because they're expecting that they, they have to look after me in old age. But if they don't think they have to look after them, then they just kick them out. That's it. The same thing, they give money to 
They, they give man, money to unmarried women. Oh, sorry, unmarried mothers. Sorry, unmarried mothers because they, there were a few unmarried mothers and then they thought, well, you know, it's not really their fault and the children are suffering. Let's give them some money. And then we found that most or a large percentage of the women, then they didn't need husbands anymore because you get money anyway. So what do you need a husband for? The government gives you money. So you can have a succession of boyfriends and the government gives you money. So you don't need a husband. So love in the material world. Yes, I'm sorry. It probably happened to you. That's probably your wife too. Or husband as the case may be. That love in this material world is shallow, not real love at all. So unless we develop or redevelop, it's not really a matter of developing, or uncover our love for Krishna, then in this material situation, we simply want to exploit others. All relationships are based on exploitation. So when we, when we talk about our relationship with Krishna, it's, a, it's in a different, there's a different paradigm to it altogether. Instead of exploitation, it's simply giving. The, the devotee wants to give to Krishna. Now, not that he, anything can be given to Krishna, but the, the sentiment is that, that we want to give to Krishna. That's there in the material world also. That love means giving, but it's always with the expectation of some return. So unless and until we understand this principle that that uh, Krishna te akila chishta, all endeavors should be for Krishna, not for me. Idam narayanaya namama in the yagya we offer. We say this is offered to Narayana, not for me. The yagyas are generally performed for some purpose. What will for some specific purpose? What shall we get? by offering this yagya. But the, in the Vaishnava yagya that is offered simply for the pleasure of Vishnu, then the repeated uh, invocation, Ahuti, is idam narayanaya namama. This is meant for narayana, not for me. So this is the uh, <coughs> reason why Bhagavatam is Srimad Bhagavatam Purana Mamalam. It is the spotless Purana. And therefore it is Pramana Mamalam. It is the spotless Pramana or evidence, uh, or authoritative scripture. This is why it is Grantaraj, this the king of all literatures. Because only in the Srimad Bhagavatam is this sentiment, uh, ahaituki bhakti, savai pung sang paro dharmo yato bhaktir adhoksha jay, ahaituki apratihata yaya asu prasidati. Only here is this, only in Srimad Bhagavatam is this delineated from beginning to end. Mm. Ahaituki bhakti, without any personal motive to adhoksaja, this, this term adhoksaja, he who is not understandable by the material senses, this term is being elaborated upon by Yamaraj in instructing his messengers. He, although he doesn't specifically use the word, but he's elaborating on the meaning of the Supreme Lord who cannot be seen by the eyes, cannot be heard by the ears, cannot be understood by the man. And then we say, then you come to the impersonal idea that, well, he's completely beyond any understanding at all. But he is visible to eyes, which eyes? Premanjana churita bhakti vilocha. He is visible to those eyes which are saturated with love for him. Those eyes which are saturated with love for him, 
not only can see him, but do see him everywhere, in all times, all places, and all circumstances. Yomam Pashiti Sarvatra Savam Chamai Pashiti. Hmm, what's the next line? Sachamaina Pranash Yami. Yeah, I forgot. Maita. I forgot now. Anyway, the purport is that uh, for one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, I never lost to him, nor is he ever lost to me. So, not only does a devotee see Krishna, not only can he see Krishna, but he doesn't see anything but Krishna. Starva jangam deke na deke tarmurti. Savatra. Hmm? Savatra ishta hoita. Ishta deva murti. Whatever, whatever he sees in this world, moving or non-moving, he sees only Krishna. So Krishna can be seen, but the point is being made again and again. We cannot perceive Krishna through our contaminated senses. The contamination is the desire to enjoy separately from Krishna, which translates as the desire to exploit everything. Everything should be for my enjoyment. But everything is meant for Krishna's enjoyment. We cannot actually enjoy. It is not possible for us to enjoy. The idea that I shall enjoy is a misunderstanding because by constitution we are enjoyed. We are to be enjoyed by Krishna. And actually we, we attain pleasure by acting in our constitutional position of being enjoyed. Prabhupada many times gave the example. The, the Purusha means the male and Prakriti means the female. And Krishna is the Purusha and in relationship with him all jivas are Prakriti. So Prabhupada gave the example that in the sexual act the enjoyer is the male and the enjoyed is the female. So Mm. that is the similar role of Bhagavan with the jivas that they, they cannot enjoy the jivas cannot enjoy directly Prabhupada criticized it in the modern age women are trying to take the role of men but it's, it, it's against the feminine nature to do so even if we speak in this material world, those who those jivas who have attained female human bodies can uh, be can fulfill their psychophysical nature by acting according to that, not trying to act according to the male form. The problem is that. Everyone is Prakriti. All jivas are Prakriti. And in the male form, in the, in, the hu in the human male form, there is the feeling of being the enjoyed, and feeling of being the enjoyer instead of being the enjoyer. But that's also there in the female form. There's a kind of double identity because in the material world, everyone wants to take the artificial position of the enjoyer. But in the female body, the female nature is to be enjoyed. So they enjoy by being enjoyed. But when the... Uh, and, and that tendency, that can be uh, guided by al along religious lines so that one can become purified. By following one's own work and propensity according to religious injunctions, everyone can achieve perfection. But instead, if instead of following that, in other words, instead of the man following his duty as Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya or Shudra, or woman following her duty as a wife and mother, 
instead of following that, if they try to artificially do something else, then everything becomes, uh, the whole society becomes discordant. And one cannot, it's even very difficult to make uh, advancement spiritually if one doesn't mm -hmm. act according to one's duties as prescribed by scripture. If a shudra, if someone who has the nature of a shudra thinks, well, let me become more spiritually advanced, let me become a brahmana, then he cannot advance by doing so. He has to act like a shudra. If he tries to do, if he tries to act like a brahmana when he doesn't have the requisite qualifications, that becomes sinful. He can do, he'll do better by following his own religious duty that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita that para dharma bhayavaha shreyan svadharma vigana twice he says in Bhagavad Gita it is better to perform one's own duty according to one's psychophysical nature that is called in the, according to the gunas that's described in Bhagavad Gita in modern terms we say in psychophysical nature to, to attempt to perform another's duty is a cause of sinfulness. So one who's, or even if one is born in a Brahmana family, but he has the nature of a Shudra, for him to attempt to act like a Brahmana will cause disturbance in society. He should act, he should be trained to act as a Shudra, not artificially as a Brahmana. This artificially acting in one's wrong position has caused chaos in society and always will cause chaos in society as it's causing chaos in society at the present time by women trying to take the role of men. So there are duties prescribed in Shastra. One should, they should be followed. Yeah, or what I was saying, that, that women... <laughs> In the modern age, the idea of that one should be an enjoyer has become very prominent. So they're thinking, well, in the women's role, we can't enjoy enough. So let us take the men's role. But still, they, they cannot execute that function in the same way. It's artificial. Of course, everything in the material world is artificial. But the, the, the psychophysical nature that one... Uh, is awarded according to one's previous activities. That is a very strong conditioning. So rather than work against that, one is recommended to uh, live with it and engage that in the service of Krishna. We see even Arjuna, he thought, let me become non-violent. Better I become non-violent. But Krishna said, no, that's not for you. If Vyasadeva came to Krishna and said, I don't want to fight in this battle, he said, well, I don't want you to fight either. You're Vyasadeva. You're not, that's not your duty. Your duty is to compile the scriptures. So we don't want you fighting because when this is all over, you have to write it all down through the medium of Ganesh. So you just sit over there. You just stay up in Badarik Ashram and when it's required, you can write it all down. That's your duty. But for Arjuna... Krishna, I don't want to fight. No, you say go, go I know, Krishna, I don't want to fight. Oh, okay, all right. Don't upset Arjuna. Let's let's make him feel happy. So let's make him a little bhajan kuti. But Krishna told Arjuna that, well, even if we make you a bhajan kuti, you'll hear the sound of fighting and you'll run over there and take part in the fighting anyway. You have, your nature is so, so strong to compel you to do so. So better you fight Maman Usmarayudhyacha. You want to sit in a in a bhajan kuti and remember me, but you remember me, that's all right, but remember me and fight. Not that you remember me and don't fight. Because if you try to remember me without fighting, then instead of remembering me, you'll think about fighting. If you leave the battlefield, you'll all the time you'll be thinking what's going on in the fight. Ah, uh, then you'll get some news. Karna has pinned down Nakul and Sahadev and said, he's pinned down Nakul and Sahadev, I'm going to, I'm going to kill that Karna. He won't be able to, he won't be able to uh, restrain himself anyway. That's why Prabhupada, he told devotees, if you think you can sit at Radha Kund and be a Babaji, 
You won't sit, you won't do chanting. You'll eat and sleep and think of women and money and fall down. <laughs> because we don't have that adhika. We don't have that eligibility to simply sit and chant. And even if we did, if we're so elevated that we, we are, our mind is so peaceful and fixed on Krishna that we can simply sit and chant. And better you come out and preach if you're so advanced. Give your association to others. So either way, you want to sit and chant? Why? Well, I'm, you know, I'm just so attracted to the holy names. If it's actually so, then you should go out and preach and let others become attracted to the holy names. Oh, I'm, I just want to sit and chant. Why does he want to sit and chant? Because he wants to avoid preaching. So then that's not a, So then you go and sit and chant and your sitting and chanting will simply be sitting and sleeping and chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, this girl and that girl. And I could do a business scheme and maybe filter Radha Kund water and sell it to pious people and make lots of money. And in this way, you'll fall down. So, better to act according to our nature. The nature means our real nature is a servant of Krishna. So, sometimes this is cited, I will act according to my nature. It's cited as an excuse to avoid service. That now you have to go on book distribution. Well, it's not my nature. My nature is to sit in the temple and sleep all day. So, uh, Actually, it's, uh, whose nature is it to go out on book distribution? This is surrender. This is going beyond your nature. It's, but, uh, yeah, there's acting according to nature and there's acting according to surrender. Do the needful. Prabhupada often said, do the needful. Do what is required to serve Krishna. So to do that, we may have to, we may have to do something which is... Uh, not according to our nature. I was just saying the other day that, that devotee was very Brahminical devotee, very Brahminically inclined. Did I say that here? He was asked to take out the garbage. Maybe I said that in Czech Republic. I was, well, in Bhaktivedanta Manor, this must have been about 1977, Bhaktivedanta Manor in England. There's one devotee who was very Brahminical. He would do pujari service and Preaching, people come to tell me, speak with them, very soft spoken, very gentlemanly, very shastric, and led very nice bhajans and kirtans. He was considered like real Brahmin. So one day, the town president, he told me actually that the Tamil president one day had asked him, Prabhu, could you help carry out the garbage? So, you know, he's an older devotee, and usually the, the new bhaktas, as we call them. Uh, they they are given this kind of service. So he's a little surprised. He said, "Yeah, okay." So he went, and then some present called back. Actually, you don't have to do it. But I just wanted to see whether you're a Brahmin or a Vaishnava. <laughs> are you attached to being a Brahmin? No, no, I'm I'm too clean. I can't carry out the garbage. Are you a Vaishnava prepared to do anything for Krishna, or are you a a Brahmin? Prabhupada sometimes criticized. Big tuft of hair on their head and chanting so many mantras but not doing anything practical for the mission of serving Krishna. So the Sankirtan movement, it's as Prabhupada often gave the example, military example, it's like a war in the military. So many men, and nowadays women, because they have equal rights. Now women, instead of looking after children, they can go and kill them in another country. Of course, you're not supposed to kill children, but they're the innocent victims of war, so we're told. So you have equal rights to go and bomb other countries and be a nice woman. So, it's nasty. So, the men are called to war, they don't say, they don't say well, what's your propensity? Because no one is, there's not that many people who have a kind of Yamaduta propensity to to pull out a machine gun and shoot people and charge into machine gun fire. Who's, well, uh, whose propensity is it here that the other, the other side is shooting and you have to charge? Any volunteers? But they do it because it's a war and there's no question of 
You know, who wants to do it? You just have to follow orders. That's another myth that everyone's equal and everyone's all the same. It's not the true anywhere. It's not true in the go in the army and say and say we want democracy. Who's been in the army? You're in the army? You're all all in the communist countries they used to have. The draft. You have to go in the army, so it's all equal. You go you go go to work, get a job in an office or a factory and see how everyone's equal. It's not. You have to follow the orders. So this idea, everyone's equal, it's a bogus idea. It's not at all applicable in any human society. Where you get more than three or four people, there's always someone who's dominant. So this idea that everyone's equal, it's a completely bogus idea, which is... But there's so much democracy. We have to have democracy. Everyone has to be equal. And if if you don't have a democratic state, we'll come and bomb you and burn you and make sure you're all democratic. So, because we want everyone to be equal. So, what's better to be be under a one ruler or to be democratically bombed to death? See, all my family members died, but I have a vote. (laughs) I can now vote. You can't vote to bring them back to life. There's so many bogus ideas. Liberty, this idea. Liberty is another bogus idea. Everyone should have liberty Better, they don't know how to behave. Better to be controlled. You give people liberty, and, but they don't know how to use it. And then uh, modern society, they have liberty that uh, you have pornography all over the place. And the advertisements, it's practically pornographic. On the TV show, a few years ago in Ljubljana, I was going to watch one Prabhupada video. In those days, they still had videos. So 10 o'clock in the morning during the summer holiday season, I went in and turned on the TV and there's an American nudie film. This is your liberty. So you give, you give people without higher consciousness liberty and what do they do? They drink, they smoke, they fornicate. You know what fornicate means? It means sex outside of marriage. The, the word is an old English word. It's gone out of fashion. Now people don't use it because sex nowadays within marriage or outside of marriage, it's considered there's no difference. Pig society. There used to be a word called fornication, but now they just say, we're making love, that's all. Because they don't consider whether inside marriage, outside marriage. This is their liberty. You should be free to make love left, right, and call. they call it love, but it's just sex, that's all. What, what love? So, liberty, equal, liberty, what is that? Liberté, égalité, fraternité, all bogus ideas. Liberty means, proper use of liberty is to choose to serve Krishna. Otherwise, within human society, where we are controlled in so many ways, our body is, uh, we, we require food, we require shelter, we have to make so many arrangements. In, in human society, they say, even in the free we have a free society and to to keep it free you have to pay more than 50% taxes so 6 months of the year you're working just to pay the taxes to keep the army who's fighting somewhere in Iraq so you can be free you're free to work to pay the government to have the army to keep you free and if you protest against it they'll send the army in against you this is your freedom. Exploitation. That's the that's the, the tendency. Exploitation. They will exploit. That's that's why they want the that's why they say we want liberty. Because the the rulers, instead of using it, instead of using the uh, power given to guide people towards God, they used it to exploit for their sense gratification. That's why they say, we don't want any rulers, we want to be free from rulers, but still you're ruled, one way or the other, either directly or by psychological manipulation. You're ruled. So the same thing, the women they want our liberty because the men are exploiting us. But... Uh, as Prabhupada said, it's better to have one man exploit you than every man exploit you. At least you maintain your chastity. But the, the, the idea is that 
If the society is actually God-centered, then the, the spirit of exploitation, which is intrinsic to this material world, that will be reduced. Not only reduced, but by the laws of dharma, the, uh, the exploitive tendency is controlled, the laws of Varnashram society. If they can, if that can be misused. Everything in this world can be misused. Bhagavad Gita is misused. The best things in this world are misused. But if the actual essence is propagated, then everyone can live as happily as possible in this material world and make progress towards Krishna. But if not, it doesn't matter what it is. You have communism, socialism, capitalism, thisism, thatism. But it all ends up with a few people exploiting others. <laughs> whatever system you have, whatever political party, it doesn't really make that much difference which political party you vote for because it, it ends up more or less the same anyway. It's just, uh, they have this show of democracy, but in the, everyone knows. It. The big business houses are controlling the policies. So, uh, it's not really a matter of changing the system or making new ideas of how we should organize society. Rather, the how to organize society, the best system's already been given. Chatur Vanyam Maya Shrishtam, the four varnas are organized by Krishna. But it's not just a matter of the four varnas, but how that is set up. How, how that runs, what is the principle that has to be uh, guided by brahmanas, real brahmanas. Real brahmana means one who has no tendency to exploit, but has only the tendency to serve, who gives advice to others for their benefit, seeing their benefit not in terms only of their immediate material needs, but in terms of their eternal spiritual needs. He gives advice to individuals for the benefit of the individual and for the benefit of the whole society based on knowledge of the principles of reality, of, of eternality, of the spiritual world, and how those principles are to be uh, enacted within this material world. So Prabhupada, he... he gave so many, actually, revolutionary ideas, which I've heard it said, and actually I should check that out, but I, we often used to hear that Prabhupada said that if they knew what I was coming to, if they actually understood what I was going to preach, they would have never let me off the ship in Boston. <laughs> and actually, if you, re if you read Prabhupada's books, I mean, the things he says, the... It's amazing how the governments allow them. It must be Yoga Maya's arrangement, because it's amazing. The things that Prabhupada said, they're actually illegal in some countries now. Like in India, it's illegal to speak in favor of Sati, the, the wife, Sahamara, burning herself with her husband. But Prabhupada's books advocate it. Of course, it's advocated, and then they'll have to close down so much of the Shastra, because it's there in, in Shastra then uh, it's illegal in some states in America to, and I believe in England also, because I remember when I arrived in England, I saw something about the police will not tolerate any racial or any remarks against racial or against homosexuality. You're not even allowed to talk, you're not even allowed to say that you're against it. Even, where's the democracy? It's supposed to be freedom of thought, freedom of speech, but you're not allowed to say that we're against homosexuality. Whereas 100 years ago, if you said you're in favor of it, you were stuck in prison. Now, if you, Nowadays, if you say we're against it, you're stuck in prison. And prison's a dangerous place because there's homosexual rapes in there. That's a dangerous place. Don't go there if you can avoid it. So, uh, but Prabhupada's books state very clearly that Homosexual, the propensity for homosexuality is demoniac. 
and so many things. Uh, this uh, Prabhupada was against democracy, which is considered like sacred in the in the in the uh, humanistic secular society. These things, democracy, freedom of speech. There's no freedom of speech. Not that everyone can just talk all nonsense, whatever they like. The, those who are brahmanas, self-controlled, who are knowledgeable in Shastra, they should speak. People who know the truth and what is beneficial for human society, they should speak. It's not that every idiot should stand up and speak. We, we have to respect all opinions as equal. Why? Why should the opinion of a, of a learned, self-controlled person and the opinion of a, of a child or a fool be considered on the same level. But there's this stupid idea that all opinion we have to respect all opinions. Why? If someone's talking nonsense, why should we respect my opinion is two plus two equals five. You're a fool. Why should we respect it? It's clear you're a fool. So uh, but there's this idea. No, everyone has to be able to say what they like. But no, well, that's not beneficial to human society. They should be stopped from speaking. Don't speak. Or learn to speak properly. Don't just say whatever you like. So Prabhupada wanted to bring in this uh, principles which to persons sworn to freedom of freedom to pursue sense gratification. This seems very repressive. Actually it is. The society that Prabhupada wanted to bring in is repressive. It represses the, 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 that which is uh, harmful to us. That should be repressed. The, this idea that we should have... Why shouldn't I just do what I like? This is how a child talks. The whole modern society is based on a childish principle. The child is playing with some some medicine gets off the shelf and the mother snatches her no don't do it. you'll kill yourself oh why are you taking it away I can enjoy myself my mother's so cruel so we advocate the same thing no don't have your slaughterhouses don't have your pornography don't have your free sex don't have your homosexuality stop it all live a civilized life no why we should have freedom to do what we like but it's harmful. You don't realize. There are the Yamadutas. We got off the subject of the verse here, but you bring it back now. It all, <laughs> it all ends up with the Yamadutas. Unless you read Srimad Bhagavatam and follow what's in it, then you end up with an appointment with Yamaraj. He's a pure devotee, but he doesn't deal with the sinful people uh, like devotees. He deals with them in the manner that they deserve. He's in the justice department. It's a thankless task. It's not a pleasant task, but it's required. So, people don't know. Lokasya janato vidbhams chakre sapata samhita. They don't know about bhakti yoga. Adhoksaja, unto the transcendent Lord who is not perceivable by mundane senses. Therefore, Vyasadeva compiled this Sāvata Samhita, the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this temple, Iskand Zurich, was until recently famous for distributing so many books. Now I think Ljubljana is distributing more, probably. Is it? He is a representative leader of the Sankirtan party from Iskon, Ljubljana. They're distributing. You know where Ljubljana is? We said the, yesterday to some, that Mataji, she never heard of it. It's like, you know Berlin, but you don't know Ljubljana. So, meanwhile, people are living their lives, drinking beer, eating sausages, and going to the Yamadutas. So, I'm leaving here, you're staying, so I request you to at least in, in some way try to 
get this book distribution going again. It's for your own benefit also, because Prabhupada will be satisfied. Param Tattva was telling me, Param Tattva Prabhu was telling me the kind of kirtans they used to have when the book distribution was in full swing. You don't get that kind of kirtan now, because that, that however nicely we can sing and Madanga beats and all this kind of thing, but the same spirit, if, we, if we're getting the mercy of Srila Prabhupada and the Parampara, then the kirtans, they come alive. Because we, then we're praying. You can own how to distribute books. What's the technique? What's the main technique? You just, the main technique is you just have to pray. How are people going to take these books? They don't take these books. But somehow or other, by the enthusiasm of the devotee, they take, because the devotee is convinced that they, the devotee out of his compassion is convinced that people need this book. Unless they take this book, they're going to be going to see the Yamadutas out of compassion. The devotee wants to distribute. So he had, but it's, it's not easy at all. The devotee has to pray, and that praying and praying, that makes intense devotional service. And then by the that intensity, the, the, the person, the, just on the street or in their home, and they just become overwhelmed by that. And they agree to take the book. But it's every single person who is approached. It's one big bag of false ego with no desire to serve Krishna. No desire, but somewhere very deep in the heart. And every single person, the devotee has to pray, Oh Krishna, please inspire this person to take this book. So it's it's extremely intense and, and the reward for the devotee is kirtan. <laughs> the bliss of kirtan. So those kind of kirtans, that they may not be very expert musically, but of course expertise in Musical in Kirtan is also nice. That's pleasing to Krishna. But the spirit of uh, Krishna, we're praying for your mercy so we can give this mercy to others. That is very purifying for ourselves and for the whole world. So this narration of Ajamil, which is now expanded into the narration of how Yamaraj is instructing his messengers, the Yamadutas. This all came about from Parikshit Maharaj's compassion. Can you remember? What is that? How is this narration of Ajamil spoken in relation to Parikshit Maharaj's which question? What did he ask Shukdev Goswami? Anyone? Apart from him. Anyone knows? Yeah, please tell save the people from the hellish condition. Right, at the end of the fifth canto, in the fifth canto of Bhagavatam, of course Shukadeva was just speaking and now it's divided into cantos. He didn't say, well that's the end of the fifth canto, now let's start the sixth. But it's divided like that by Vyasadeva. So in the fifth canto there's a description of the universe and in the course of describing the universe he describes the hellish planets and the hellish punishments. So Parikshit Maharaj says, oh that's horrible. And how can people be delivered? from this. So, Shukdev gave some different ideas. Well, you can do prayas chitta. You do some ritualistic ceremonies, but Pariksha Maharaj wasn't satisfied. Yeah, well, I've seen so many people do prayas chitta, but they just go on sinning again and again. Then you cultivate jnana, but Pariksha Maharaj still wasn't satisfied. That, that doesn't really solve the problem. Then, Kechit Kevalaya Bhaktya Vasudeva Parayana Aghangdhun Vanti Kartsnena Niharami Vabhaskara Then Shukdev Goswami said that only by pure devotional service, if someone takes up pure devotional service, he, if he's attached to Vasudeva, Omnamo Bhagavate Vasudeva, then that completely removes even the propensity for sinful reaction. Even one may cultivate gan, this is right, this is wrong, but the seed of 
sinful desire remains in the heart, but by pure devotional service to Krishna, even the seed of the desire for sinful life that is completely uprooted. Or the example is given, just like the fog of illusion is dissipated by the rising sun. So in this connection, Shukdev Goswami spoke the story of Ajamiya, the Brahmana youth, who became corrupted by bad association, but by the uh, by chanting the holy name, which chanting came about due to his previous attachment to Vasudev, to Narayana. Uh, he, he was able to uh, remember Narayana at the time when the Yamadutas came to get him. Hare Krishna. Is there any question, comment, or protest? Sometimes there are protests. That's fun. Yeah, please. If a sinful person has to take a very low species of life, how to, uh, to diminish the consciousness in that low species? Uh, I don't understand it. What? How does the consciousness become diminished? Well, his, in the human form of life, if one develops low consciousness, then he gets the, the body follows the consciousness. So because one has very low animal-like desires, therefore he gets a suitable body. How that's arranged by material nature? Prakriti, what is that? Purusha prakriti stohi bhunte prakriti jan guna. Karanam guna sango sadasadhyoni janmasu. The jiva who is in material nature is trying to enjoy this material nature, gets various better or worse bodies within it according to his desire to enjoy it. Then again, there's that uh, karmana daiva nitrena. According to our activities, karma, under the guidance of the Supreme Lord and the demigods, one gets a suitable kind of body. Or bodies. We may go through many bodies. We have many material desires and we get various bodies which are a combination of reward and punishment. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada said about the surfers, they're surfing in the sea. Prabhupada saw them in California when he was walking on the beach. So Prabhupada said, in the next life they'll got the body of a fish. So that's a mixed reward and punishment because they like to live like that. They take pleasure in uh, playing in the water. So they could, a more suitable body to get that pleasure is that of a fish, but that's also a punishment. Because to go from the human species to the fish species is a punishment. So you get mixed. You have a doggish consciousness. So you take pleasure in, in uh, shouting at others and driving them away. Doggish consciousness. So you're in a better position to do that as a dog. That's, so you get the body of a dog. But that, so that's a reward and punishment. Both. You desire to be a leader. I want to be a leader. Others should follow me. So you're, they're, 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 that is fulfilled, but because you don't have the punya to be a human, so you become the leader of a pack of dogs. So your desire is fulfilled, but in a different species. It's very dangerous material life, very horrible. Anything else?